the two fields that we're talking about, as far as I can see, because there are two fields at stake, really, right? There is the field of, um, let's call it rights-based approaches, the whole, f uh, all the stuff ab about how to use human rights in a development <coughs> practice, and a field of conflict sensitivity or something, whatever we want to call that too, right? These two fields really are born only, um, as far as I can remember, in, in the late 1990s, really, mid-1990s, which is actually very, very re recently still, if you think about it, right? And there was a reason why they came into being, as far as I know. Um, which was that there was a sense, a quite a widespread sense at that, at that point in time, uh, maybe strongly influenced by the case of Rwanda, but also a whole bunch of other places, of course, that, that what you could call normal professionalism and the normal right way of doing humanitarian aid or the normal right way of doing development aid uh, seemed to lead sometimes to rather dramatically suboptimal outcomes. Right? It seemed that somewhere we were misunderstanding uh, core social dynamics, and that as a result of that, um, the impact of our work, even if done well on its own terms, was, was at the very least unsustainable, as was witnessed by mass conflict, mass violence, mass destruction, but possibly even actually no feeding into those very dynamics and so on, and that we didn't seem to understand it very well that something in our normal professionalism maybe was blind, at least in part, to some of these issues that led to violent conflict that might have had to do with human rights and governance and so on. I think that is a feeling that quite a few people had. I myself for sure had it. Um, and I actually wrote a book about that at the time called Aiding Violence, um, which is by now already 10 years old. But others did too. And, and at the time then Mary Anderson started with her work on, on, on do no harm, which as well was based on the premise that if you don't watch out, even if it wasn't your intention at all, and even if you don't re realize it at all, you are having an impact on bigger economic dynamics, social dynamics, political dynamics foremost, power dynamics that you might not necessarily realize, and yet you have it. And that impact can be negative if you don't pay attention. And so out of all this criticism and this thinking, I think grew two new fields really essentially, right? Or at least grew a sense that change was necessary. A rights-based approach and conflict sensitivity, as I said already earlier, go hand in hand very well, right? A priori, they deal with similar sort of issues. Uh, one of the things on the little paper for today that I saw, one of the aims that Maureen mentioned, was to understand this whole business of rights violations as a consequence of violent conflict and as a cause of violent conflict. And evidently that's correct. It's also a total platitude of no use whatsoever, uh, but it is, however, correct. Um, I mean, the reason they say that it's a platitude is you can't do anything with it, right? Of course it's true, and then, you know, so what? How does it help you to make the real tough decisions? And this is about tough decisions, right? In a post-conflict context, you're always making tough decisions about who you work with and who not, who you give meager resources to and whom not. In a rights-based context, you are also making tough decisions about which rights you're working on and which not. So a post-conflict situation may feel, I think, like a good moment to get something moving on the rights-based front as well. There is maybe some space there suddenly. There is also typically quite a lot of money around, eh? because that's typically what happens after a conflict, especially if the conflict gets solved with a peace agreement or something, and the international community is happy with the whole situation and likes to show its support, and at least for a few years out there, there is dull, lots of it. Eh? At the same time, often governments are weak still, civil societies are maybe not too strong and so on. So, you know, whatever we wish, we can sort of get away with quite a bit maybe. We've taken the use in any case during the war already to manage a lot of the show while we were doing the humanitarian aid business. And so we feel like, hmm, you know, we know the place, we're ready, we got a vision. So everything seems to be in place to move forward. At the same time, of course, that's not true either. Post-conflict situations or situations of ongoing conflict are extremely tough to make progress in on, on rights-based matters. And I want to discuss that for a moment. I'd like to discuss a number of factors that I was thinking of that are both internal to aid agencies or to aid actors or to development actors and external to them and that make it hard to make progress on, on, on a rights-based approach in a conflict context. So first, let me do the ones inside development organizations. I think I got four, but I forgot. We'll see. 
So the first one is that this, your own staff or the, the staff of your partners, but the people involved in doing this sort of stuff may have very different opinions themselves about matters of rights, right? This does not make life very easy, right? Even if a country is not a dictatorial one, eh? and even if one can speak rather freely about matters of rights and be critical and self-critical and so on, it is likely that in a conflict context, these matters are very painful for staff and very divisive even for staff to talk about. When you say the word genocide in Burundi, uh, it means very different things to very different people, right? And right away then, uh, there, you start diverging. And talking about it is not easy, even though it is possible. Burundi is not a dictatorship where you cannot talk about these issues. Yet it is extremely hard for people to actually do it. <coughs> and, and if you can't talk about it as an agency, or if you can't see eye to eye on it, evidently it will be very hard to move forward on it. And post-conflict situations are precisely the sort of, of times that it's very hard to talk about the very most important things.